Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 177 of the Healthy Skin Show. In today's episode, we're going to take a deep dive into one of the most requested topics, the liver detox skin rash connection. I initially talked about this in episode 47, but I get so many questions about the episode which prompted me to put this together for you. This episode will be the first of a two-part, maybe three-part series, we'll see, about liver detoxification. So stay tuned for part two. And look, I get it. Liver detox is complicated for two reasons. First, you've been heavily marketed to and repeatedly told online that you need to, quote, detox your liver or to do a detox to fix your skin. Literally nothing could be further from the truth in my opinion, and I'll talk about why that is in a moment. And it only feeds into the confusion about what your liver really needs. Secondly, most people have either entirely forgotten high school biochemistry or they never learned about it in the first place. And that's okay. Biochemistry can feel really overwhelming. And frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if your mind just totally wanders as soon as someone like myself starts talking about it. I had to take biochemistry for something like six or seven semesters during grad school. So it's not like I picked it up in a day or just from listening to a podcast. It's been a big deal to me to simplify complicated topics like this so that you can follow along picking up nuggets here and there to understand the larger concept. By no means is this podcast a crash course in nutritional biochemistry. I teach about these concepts deeper in my group program called the Skin Rash Rebuild and in my two and a half hour long eczema masterclass. So if you're inspired to get a little nerdy with me, those are a great next step. For now, let's dive deep into the liver detox skin rash connection. First and foremost, your liver is not a fish filter. A valid point shared with me by a previous guest on the show, Chris Masterjohn. Now, if you've heard that analogy and believe that's how your liver works, please throw that idea in the trash. The process of detoxification is really more one of transformation rather than fixation solely on toxins and waste. I seriously doubt that you would consider sex hormone conversions, for example, that your liver is responsible for via these liver detox pathways as toxic. We need to turn progesterone into testosterone and estrogen, right? So some of what your liver deals with is handling waste and toxic substances, but it's not like they just get lodged in your liver. Toxins and toxic substances are converted via the detox process to ultimately become water soluble so you can urinate them out. Some of these detox pathways need support because without that support and the nutrients they depend upon, toxins will back up and backed up toxins can end up getting pushed out other elimination routes like your skin. And that's why you'll hear me again and again and again say that your liver requires support much more than it needs another detox. And this process happens, by the way, in three phases of your liver. So we call this liver detoxification. There's three phases and they are distinct. Some people will say there are four phases, but I think for simplicity's sake, let's just focus on the three. So with that said, let's kick this off by talking about what each phase does and the importance of optimizing each phase and keeping one in balance with the others. Phase one is based on your genes and is actually called the cytochrome P450 system. Genes that are a part of the P450 system start with the letters CYP. These genes code for enzymes that ultimately do the work of phase one. Genetic SNPs in those genes can alter how the enzymes function, meaning how fast or how slow they process things. Additionally, certain substances can upregulate or downregulate genes. 
Upregulation is like hitting the gas pedal on your car. So basically, upregulation speeds up how fast they process things. And this is a very important point, by the way, but we'll talk about more on that in a moment. Whereas downregulation is like pumping the brakes, such that the enzymes will process things more slowly. Substances can also up or down regulate your phase one liver detox enzymes, including things like cruciferous vegetables, CBD oil, liver detox herbs like milk thistle, which, by the way, are problematic for someone with a ragweed allergy, caffeine, alcohol, high protein diets, steroid hormones, certain vitamins and certain chemical exposures. Once a substance goes through phase one liver detoxification, it's generally made more toxic. Yes, you heard me correctly. They are made more toxic. And that byproduct must now go through phase two liver detoxification to be made water soluble so that you can urinate it out of your body. And this is a significant point because if phase one is upregulated or sped up, phase two has to be prepared to do its job. And that's where problems can really end up showing up. But let's talk about phase two liver detoxification first. In my previous podcast on why I don't believe you should do a liver detox, I used the analogy of Lucy and Ethel from the show I Love Lucy working at the chocolate factory to explain my position. If you haven't checked out that episode, you definitely should because I shared the chocolate factory clip there so you can really kind of see what's going on in phase two. But as far as the nuts and bolts, phase two liver detoxification is interesting in that there are multiple pathways that handle different toxins and substances. Everything that typically is processed by phase one then goes through phase two. But some substances can actually skip phase one entirely and just head directly into phase two. And that's significant because phase two has to handle the burden from both phase one and everything that doesn't need to go through phase one. So the load is even greater. And the pathways in phase two include things like the glycine pathway, which you probably heard me talk about, glutathione conjugation, sulfation, and glucuronidation. And what's more, the pathways from phase two all require certain nutrients to work. The glycine pathway, for example, requires the amino acid glycine and B6. I talk a lot about the glycine pathway because it handles things like salicylates, solvents, pesticides, and waste products naturally produced in your gut microbiome. Now that's important because the greater the level of dysbiosis or imbalance within your gut, the greater the burden is for this pathway. Hold that for a moment because we got to talk about what phase three of liver detoxification does. Phase three of liver detox is really focused on how you get these substances out of your body. Most commonly, that's by peeing them out now that they're water soluble. This underscores the need for appropriate water intake. And in some instances, these substances can also be pooped out, which is why constipation is something you must address. Bowel movement is an elimination pathway, and that's why I constantly stress that a healthy pattern is one to three formed stools per day. Magnesium citrate can be a helpful tool, as can aloe juice, in optimizing stool frequency. Now, without proper urination and pooping, waste products from liver detox continue to sit in your body longer than they should. And if they can't even make it through phase two, you're likely going to experience problems. So the point to all of this is that you want to balance between phase one detox all the way through phase three. Perhaps you're starting to see where hiccups can arise. Now that we've talked through the three phases, let's talk about the problems. The problems with liver detox are rooted in my position that doing liver detoxes or cleanses often exacerbate liver detox pathway imbalances because these products typically rely on herbs that generally speed up phase one detox, resulting in a lot more toxic byproducts. Knowing that phase two requires nutrients to process these toxins from phase one, in addition to other toxins, you know, like from an imbalance in the gut microbiome, this is where things can really go sideways. As a reminder here, your body generally doesn't make all the nutrients it needs to thrive. 
In cases where it does make needed nutrients like glutathione, your body still requires the raw ingredients to produce it. So think of your body as a nutrient consumption factory rather than something that can make what it needs to operate at 100%. And this emphasizes why you have to eat and absorb nutrients. So if phase two pathways require nutrients that your body generally doesn't make, what do you think happens if the amount of toxins waiting for processing increases? What could happen if your nutrient stores needed for these pathways run low? And what if these two problems happen at the same time? Let me tell you, phase two detox pathways slow down. That can create a backup of toxins waiting to get pushed down their respective phase two pathways. And the load of toxins continues to increase as phase one runs. Then with additional environmental exposures along with gut bug waste products, you're just swimming in waste. You might start to see your liver enzymes, typically tested on a comprehensive metabolic panel, become elevated. And you could notice that your flares and skin seem a lot worse because your natural detoxification system is overwhelmed. This is why I do not recommend herbs for liver detox, liver cleanses, or liver detox programs for those with chronic skin rashes. Instead, I focus on supporting phase two and phase three first. And it's why I also use P2 Detox in my practice. This is from quellshop.com. And if you guys want to check that out, you can head on over to this episode's show notes. I use this with my clients because it does not speed up phase one. Instead, it hands your liver what it needs for phase two, especially to help clear out the backup hanging out between phase one and phase two while you're on your journey. There are also fewer flare-ups or reactions as well from those who have a lot of pollen allergies since it doesn't contain any herbs. Now, I do want to say one thing here about liver detoxes. There may be a time and a place for them in those with psoriasis due to its connection to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but that's only after your liver detox system as a whole is better supported and excess burdens are minimized. I'm going to talk more about that in part two of this conversation because, as I said in the beginning, this topic is complicated. I've heard from too many people that they have had horrible reactions after doing liver detoxes, which is what initially piqued my interest in this area. And it's helped me understand why supporting your liver is a crucial first step to solving chronic skin rash issues before and during your journey. All of the resources and links associated with this episode can be found at skinterrupt.com forward slash 177. I'd love for you to leave your comments and questions and even some thoughts if you have them on this topic over there so that I can address them in part two of this series. And I also encourage you to share this episode with people who think that doing a liver detox is going to fix their skin. It's my hope that this will save them a lot of time and potentially from unnecessary flare-ups. And before you head off for your day, take a moment to rate and review The Healthy Skin Show on your podcast platform. Make sure to hit the subscribe button so you can tune in each week for new research, tips, and inspiration. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you not just in part two, but also in the next episode.